Now, in recent weeks, we have been learning more about the traces of pharmaceutical drugs found in our tap water, in our drinking water. The research conducted by the Associated Press shows at least 41 million Americans could be drinking water concentrated with sex hormones, antibiotics, and mood stabilizers. Now, the concentrations are small, but are still causing concern among medical experts about long-term consequences. Joining us to discuss this is Sharon Mualam, uh, author of the book Survival of the Sickest, The Surprising Connections Between Disease and Longevity. Sharon, thanks so much for your time. Thanks for having me. When you first heard about the research, what did you think and how concerned are you? Um, well, when I first heard it, I mean, the most important thing is the amount of uh, drugs that are found in the drinking water. And since the amounts are, are pretty minuscule, I wasn't concerned. But then when I found out that some of the drugs in the pharmaceuticals are uh, hormones or the breakdown products of hormones, uh, that got me a little bit worried. Uh, the reason is these, these uh, hormones work at very small concentrations. If you think about the birth control pill, mm -hmm. um, you know, which stops a woman from getting pregnant, most of, of uh, the pill that a woman's taking is actually filler. So the amount of drug, the active ingredient, is, is minuscule. We're talking uh, micrograms here. So, uh, and the effects can be rather long term. So you are particularly concerned about the sex hormones found in the water. So because of that, are you making any changes? Are you encouraging your family and friends to make any changes to their habits when it comes to well, drinking water? Well, I mean, it's a great question. What, what, what are we supposed to do? And the problem is there's no real good filter system. I mean, reverse osmosis works, but that's expensive to get installed in your home. You know, carbon filters, they don't filter out pharmaceuticals. And most of the drinking water that you find bottled is actually just reprocessed tap water. So, mm -hmm. I mean, at this point, we really don't have that many options. You study evolution. You study genetic codes and DNA. Uh, are some people or could some people be more susceptible to long-term problems associated with the sex hormones than others? That's a great question. Actually, uh, the answer to that is yes. It depends where your ancestors uh, came from. You know, uh, we know, for example, with caffeine, some people are really sensitive and some people aren't. And it, it all has to do uh, with evolution. If your ancestors came from, for example, East Africa, you, uh, they might have a really good uh, body to break down caffeine and aren't, don't, don't seem to be affected by it. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, it all depends upon ancestry and evolution. Well, you talk a lot about ancestry and evolution in your book, Survival of the Sickest. And one of the items that really caught my attention was how some populations uh, do better with alcohol, how the European populations don't seem to have as many problems as, say, the Asian populations. Exactly. I mean, this is really fascinating. So, um, you know, when you look back in history and you ask the question, you know, why uh, in China, for example, uh, when there was a problem with drinking water, and this is very common for all civilizations throughout history, you know, the water supply gets contaminated. So in China, people boiled the water and made tea. And in Europe, what they did was essentially was ferment everything that they get their hands on and in that way disinfect the water. So by, by fermenting, you're producing alcohol. And then there's this great pressure to be able to break down alcohol. And that's why today most Europeans have uh, the genetic makeup to handle alcohol while Asians seem to lack it. And at the same time, you see Asians seem to have such longevity due to in part perhaps healthy diets and the lifestyle. So are there any conditions that we can adopt or try to adopt from other populations to make our lives better and make our lives healthier? That's a great question. I, I think the big one now that um, that people are going to focus on is, is vitamin D. This seems to be uh, the new vitamin for the, for the decade. We're finding out that um, and vitamin D is produced uh, for, through the sun. I mean, we, uh, cholesterol in our blood gets converted into vitamin D and we get some from our diet. And this has uh, everything from uh, anti-cancer properties to, uh, you know, preventing osteoporosis. Okay, so help us to understand that because we hear so much about wear sunscreen, wear sunscreen, and then you're saying you need the vitamin D. Right. So again, this, this is the compromise that that's evolution. I mean, we evolved to need the sun um, almost as if uh, almost as if we were plants. But too much sun, of course, can cause skin cancer. So uh, new recommendations are coming out that, you know, maybe the first few minutes, five, ten minutes of sun exposure, um, you know, that's not in the midday. Uh, you know, be exposed before you get that sunscreen on, because once you put that sunscreen on, you're going to be preventing yourself from producing vitamin D. And um, people saw this in Australia where, the, you know, there's a huge increase of skin cancer. This is slip and slop campaign, just get on that sunscreen. And what they've discovered right away was um, that actually kids started getting vitamin D deficiency. And this can lead to actually bone malformations and possibly even cancer. Okay. Then at the same time, so many people try to slather on the sunscreen. And when I'm, uh, the reason I'm asking this next question is because you study evolution and you study how uh, the, the, the decisions we make now could affect us long term. Some people say the chemicals that we put on our skin when we put the sunscreen on could be detrimental long term. 
Yes, I mean, again, we don't know. A lot of these chemicals are new. They haven't been around that long. We don't know what the long-term consequences are. And uh, if these chemicals um, are, are pretty, um, you know, stable, and that's how they do their job to prevent UV from getting down into your skin. And now, actually, we may even be doing ourselves more harm by, by putting that on. Hmm. A conundrum, it seems. Back to the uh, first topic we talked about also as we wrap up this conversation, Jerome. Uh, in terms of the water, there really isn't much that we can do. So are we just supposed to be proactive at this point and just listen to news reports and, and continue waiting for additional research? I think the first thing that people should do is do not dispose of your drugs in the toilet. Uh, you know, for a very long time, people thought that this was the safest place because, you know, you don't want your kids getting into the medicine cabinet. Um, but you should actually dispose of them safely, and probably the most safest place today is in through the garbage into the landfill. At the same time, some of it will pass through us, though, when we do use the bathroom because not all of it will be absorbed in our bodies. Exactly, and I mean, that's the big concern. All right. Unfortunately. Sharon Mulem, the book is Survival of the Sickest, The Surprising Connections Between Disease and Longevity. And I know we've really just touched on the tip of your research. So fascinating. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Thank you for having me, Melissa.